Good afternoon uh, and welcome to uh, today's seminar with Professor Marco, Marco Bertini to this very exciting seminar. Uh, today's session is part of our Stay Connected platform through which we offer different webinar series uh, that cover current uh, issues and that are available through our uh, website and also through our YouTube and, and LinkedIn channels. At the end of Marco's presentation, I will be moderating a Q&A session with the questions that arise throughout his presentation and that you can send us uh, using the chat uh, that you can find. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce Marco. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Marco Bertini is Associate Professor at the Department of Marketing at the Study Business School. He got his PhD at Harvard. And Marco's research uh, lies at the interface of the economy and uh, psychology of pricing decisions. His research has been published in uh, all the top uh, marketing academic journals. And uh, I would like uh, to recommend you very much his latest book, which I think is fascinating and it's a compulsory read for any manager. The book is titled The Ends Game, How Smart Companies Stop Selling Products and start delivering value, which I think is a, a very worthwhile reading for all of you. So, uh, Marco, thank you very much thank for you. sharing your uh, thoughts and your research with us during this afternoon. We are looking forward to listening to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And, and thank you very much also for mentioning the uh, the book. That's the first time that somebody had uh, mentioned it. So, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to whoever is listening in. I'm watching in from the world. Um, so um, I'm I'm speaking to you from my son's room in my home. Uh, this has been basically my base camp throughout this uh, confinement. My son has happens to have the the best Wi-Fi connection in all of the house. He has been blessed. Uh, hence the, uh, the the decor that you find here. So I have about twenty minutes. Um, in twenty minutes, I want to do somewhat justice to this topic that I think a lot of us are feeling at the moment. You know, we are feeling the pinch in terms of demands. Um, we can do many, many things, of course, to get this demand started. Uh, the question from my expertise is, how do I try to jumpstart this economy, my economy, through the pricing things that I do without necessarily mortgaging my brand in the future? So that's kind of the idea of my talk. I have 20 minutes, far too many things to say in the time that I have. Um, but let me just go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay, I'm going to hide this as well. So uh, so let me just start by um, making an observation because I don't think everybody everybody um, um, around the world is in the same, in terms of businesses, in the same situation. I think that at the moment, given the crisis that we're facing, there's probably three kinds of businesses, I mean, to generalize a lot. Uh, there's one kind of businesses on the right here of this slide that is, you know, loving it. I mean, uh, what crisis? Uh, because of what happened, the type of categories this business were selling has found itself in very, very high demand. So as a matter of fact, the crisis, if one can even say this, has been a good thing uh, for that particular business. And here, for this kind of, um, uh, for this kind of company, um, there's really no, this, this presentation is nearly not really not for them. Uh, the only thing for them is to take advantage in a sense of the, of the boost in demand whilst of course, maintaining, um, the moral code, the moral etiquette that has developed because of the crisis that we're facing. On the other end of this, uh, of this line, you've got some very, unfortunately, some very, very, very frustrated companies. And, and those companies are also not the target of this talk because these are companies that have facing such dire situations that the actual thought of, hey, how should I worry about the way I price now in order to make sure that I don't uh, basically mortgage my future, that is not even in the question. That's not even in the cards right now because all they care about right now is saving the business and make sure there is a tomorrow. I don't even have the luxury to think about the future. So you got these two extremes of companies, and then the, to me, the majority of companies are the ones that are in the middle for which this, uh, this set of slides is targeted for. These are companies that, of course, are feeling the pinch because the man is so depressed. But at the same time, it's not so grave that, you know, I can, I can only think about tomorrow. 
I need to, I, I am aware and conscientious that the things that I do today need to be done to, you know, to get me going again. But at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that I don't necessarily hurt myself in the future. And here, uh, the next point that I want to make is the following. Yes, we're all facing, um, we're all facing downward demand, but there is, there is really two kinds of reason reasons why demand has gone down for us. Okay. I think on the one hand, the kind of uh, the depression that we're feeling in terms of demand is what we could call structural in the sense that underlying this, people's preferences really haven't changed. If they liked your product before, they still like it now. If they don't like the competition, they still don't like it now. But, you know, because of supply chain problems, because of my own finances, because of structural issues, I just cannot afford the same kind of purchases that I was making before. Either not at all, or I need to switch to something that is cheaper. But structurally, my preferences are the same. And then there is behavioral, the behavioral sort of um, um, cause of the change in demand, which actually has to do with the fact that the crisis that we're all facing has actually shifted my preferences. One could think, for example, of air travel, and people may think about air travel a little bit differently now than they did before, uh, and that's a behavioral change in demand. And, and that is a very different situation uh, than the one that um, most of us are facing, which is fundamentally structural. The market is pretty much the same. We just had a shock. How do we get this economy jump started again? And this is an important difference because the behavioral type of change demand actually would make us, would, would need us to make a stop for a second, go back and rethink about our value propositions, whereas a structural one, this, the value propositions are essentially the same. Okay. And this is important because when I think about the way we as businesses relate to our customers, I always think about this as kind of two flows, where there is a flow going from the firm out to my customer, which is in terms of the value that I deliver to them, and then the flow that it goes from the customer back to the firm in terms of the revenue that I can generate. And this sort of dy dy dynamism, this sort of wheel, uh, is predicated on the fact that I am creating value for customers. So the things that I'm going to be saying to you for the next 15 or so minutes are all predicated on the fact that me, as a company, I still have something that my customers find meaningful and unique from the competition. So it's more the structural problems that I'm trying to address as opposed to the behavioral ones, whereby actually I don't even have value to deliver anymore because now somebody else is actually preferred um, to the offering that I have. Okay, so um, we're, about, we're talking about companies who can afford to think about the future and are facing a, basically a, a, a structural sort of um, a, um, um, reduction in demand. And so here I was thinking today and yesterday as well, I was thinking about the different things that one could do from a pricing perspective to try and get this economy jumpstarted. And, and you know, there's actually quite a long list that I came up with in my house and I ran those by uh, people in my house and other colleagues. And I think at the end of the day, um, out of that big long list, I would like to speak about five given the, the time that I have. And you see them over here and I want to take them in turn. So, and by the way, from one to five, they're roughly ordered from the most tactical thing, the thing you can do basically tomorrow to the most strategic thing, something you can get started on tomorrow, but of course it'll take you a little bit more time. Okay, so let's go on with the with the first one. The first one that I the first thing that I think we should think about is making everything more liquid. Okay, now what do I mean more more liquid? Well, I think about this in three dimensions. So you basically price to your customers uh, along three x axes uh, by the products that you sell, uh, by time, okay, and also by the customers you sell to. So these are the three main axes upon which exchanges with customers occur. And my prices will always vary as a function of time, a function of product and a function of uh, and a function of customers. So typically we would like to force certain behaviors in customers. But now we're facing, you know, a demand that isn't the one that we would like to have. You need to make, in my opinion, you need to make things much more fluid. So if you were forcing bundles on customers, thinking about products, unbundle things. If you were forcing certain payment terms on customers or certain bundles of time, subscribe for a year, unbundle it, subscribe for shorter periods of time, defer payments if that makes financial sense. If you were um, perhaps pricing to certain customers in a certain way and to other customers in a different way, maybe new customers and existing customers, not unbundle that, but think about unifying those payments. 
make things more granular and put in much more flexibility because you need to be able to adjust the way you generate revenue from the marketplace to the um, situations that each one of your customers are actually facing. And before, where you had more market power, you used to force upon the market certain uh, bundles, certain structures that were convenient to you. But of course, you know, you don't have that luxury necessarily anymore. So make things much, much more fluid if you can. Uh, building exclusivity. So what do I mean by this? Any production action that you take can be copied almost tomorrow if you don't think about it too well. Uriol, who was introducing me before, you know, if he talks about, he talks about branding, uh, branding activities, those ones tend to be quite sticky. It's very hard to copy somebody else's branding campaign, right? But a price change, a discount, you can be copied tomorrow. So you have to be aware that just like you are facing a tough time, so is your competitor. And your competitors probably may be watching this seminar too. So whenever you are, whenever you are thinking about a pricing move to get customers to buy, what you want to try and do is you want to try and build in some exclusivity or a window of opportunity in the moves that you make. What you don't want to do, as you see here, is start, you know, launching tomato your competition. But of course, the competition can launch tomatoes right back at you. So you, you ensure basically that you destroy each other. And the customer in the background, of course, is the one who's happy, nice and happy, which is great, but perhaps shouldn't be that happy. So you need to be in exclusivity. How do we build in exclusivity? Well, I think there's probably a couple of ways one can do it, okay? Uh, one way you can do it is a bit of a trick in a sense, is if you're going to launch some sort of promotional campaign, brand that campaign. That is, create a brand out of the promotion itself. Why? Because you know, we know that brands have associations and meanings that separates that brand from others in the marketplace. And we always think about branding products and branding companies will brand your promotional campaign as well. Call it something, uh, give it something unique and communicate around this such that even though somebody else may have the same monetary discount as you, actually those are kind of two brandedly different campaigns that will potentially buy you some exclusivity. And of course, this is not you know uh, exact science. Uh, the other one is be very, very harsh about it. And what I mean by here is, is don't necessarily broadcast to the, to the however many wins there are out there. You know, use, use technology, use applications, use CRM, use whatever techniques you have available to try and make your promotions very targeted to individuals, very individualized, better said, to individuals. You want to make sure you don't make so much noise out of your campaigns that are easily spotted by the competition. The more you make it targeted, the least likely that to be picked up, okay? And again, somewhat more of exclusivity you try, you gain for yourself. This is critical because if you copy yourself, you, a, a competition copies you straight away, you get yourself in this sort of prisoner's dilemma that at the end of the day doesn't really help much. Um, quid pro quo. Okay, so this is number three. Quid pro quo is, is the idea that if I'm going to give a discount to my consumers because my consumers are suffering and I want them, you know, I want to give them something to help to, to, to buy me, okay? Well, don't stop there in a sense. Ask for something in return. At the end of the day, you're doing them a favor because they still like you, remember? They, their preferences are still kind of intact. So they still like you. What you want to do is give them the discount by all means, but ask for something in return. Don't just give them the discount. Ask for something in return, aside from buying, of course. And this is of two flavors. One is, well, I'm going to ask something from you that is of strategic importance to my business. I need to survive tomorrow. So if Gaining share is important. If word of mouth is important, I'm just reading off the slide here. If increasing value spent is important to my business, then tie the discount to a certain condition. A yes, but. You can have the discount, but, okay, do this. Let's be concrete. Amazon has Prime Day, which is a discount once a year, only if you're a Prime member. That is critical. Why? Because if you're a Prime member, Amazon knows very well that you will spend 2.3 times more across the year on Amazon than if you were not a Prime member. So there's a strategic objective here that I want you, maybe the, the whole Prime is actually a bit of a decoy to get more people to sign up to Prime. This is strategically important to me. Um, Innocent in the UK, is, for them, it's strategically important to create a strong brand. So they would give discounts if you tweet about the brand, the condition being tweeting. 
Dropbox, as many of us know, will give you a discount if you recommend somebody else to the platform. Why? Because it's a platform. And the more people in the platform, the more network effects you create. Okay? So again, tie to something that is strategically important to you. Alternatively, tie it, tie the discount to some behavior from customers that is consistent with your brand. Let me just sort of re-say this a little bit. If you're going to have a discount, make it conditional. In this case, make it conditional on some behavior by the customer that reinforces your brand. Because this will make the brand stand out over time. For example, an old example in Mexico, uh, the, 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 the football manufacturer Puma had just released the world's fastest sneaker. Okay, that was the new positioning. Well, they invented a discount schedule that it required on having the fastest possible purchase. Have a look. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Let me just make a point here to go back to it because this can be a little bit tricky. What am I saying here? If you a, if you're gonna give a discount, that's great, but add a condition on top of just please buy me. Yeah, the customers will go along, and then b, that condition should be either something that is strategically important to you. Think back of Amazon and Prime Day, and or um, some behavior that is consistent, or better said, reinforces what your brand stands for. What you never want to do is have a condition for which the behavior is actually, maybe because you didn't pay attention to this, inconsistent with what your brand is about. Because then you'll have customers that are faced with the dilemma. Do I behave in a way that is consistent with the brand but forgo the discount? Or do I behave in a way that is consistent with the discount and save money and forget the brand? You never want to make give a, a customer a trade-off between brand and money, essentially. Okay? I'm going to skip the next example because, you know, I'm speaking a lot here. But I think I, I've, I've communicated the point. Uh, number four, let your prices speak. Um, in a time like this, it's just almost the perfect time for this. There's a, if there's a silver lining here, this is the perfect time for this. People are paying attention to your prices. Do not forget that your prices communicate stuff. Your prices speak to customers all the time, okay? Keep that in mind and make sure that you advertise through your prices. How do you do it? In two ways. Your prices will convey information, okay? So if you are, like in this example I'm going to show you in a second, if you are a company that um, designs air conditioners, this is BGH, a company in, the, uh, in Argentina, and you, you, have, you sell air conditioners and Argentina is a hot place, and instead of selling your conditioners, your brand is really about how you make people comfortable in their own home. Then think about how in the midst of a recession, you can use your prices to convey that message. Okay, to convey that message. Have a look at this campaign. Summer in the city. Homes that have the most exposure to sunlight turn into actual ovens. In partnership. 
partnership with the Buenos Aires Ministry of Urban Development and Google Maps Technology, we developed a software program capable of measuring the sun's impact on every home in the city. By logging onto our website and entering an address, residents could calculate the exact amount of hours their homes were exposed to sunlight. The accumulated hours were then converted into a discount toward the purchase of a BGH air conditioner. The longer the exposure, the bigger the discount. With an initial investment of $40,000, we obtained a turnover of $14 million. But more importantly, we turned more than 49,000 ovens back into homes. So your prices communicate the information, they speak, they also raise emotions in your customers. And this is getting very psychological on you, I understand. But they're definitely a very, very strong trigger of emotions, okay? And again, if you know this and you know the customers are paying attention to your prices, play that to your advantage. There's not a better time, unfortunately, than a crisis to use your prices to speak about yourself. I'm going to show you a commercial now, a campaign from Ikea in France that does this, I think, to perfection. Okay, let me show you. Oh, j'aime bien ça ici. J'aime bien la matière. Qu'est-ce que tu penses? C'est bien. C'est gratuit ça. Non? Fait 92. Votre nom, s'il vous plaît? Jules Gauthier. Et vous? Marie. Pourquoi? J'ai dit Marie. Merci. C'est bon, bon maman. D'accord. D'accord. Maman, tu sais, j'habite tous les pas très loin de chez toi. Hein. So I hope you caught the last particular image there, all right? The process remains small all year. Okay, uh, last but not least, I need to finish up here. Take one, take some, some uh, this should say take on, not take one, sorry. Take on some calculated risk. Okay, this is the most strategic thing that I have to say to you today, guys. So um, typically as a company, we make money, okay? Uh, this is the, the, the chapter here on the bottom right, of selling our products and services, the means that you see over here. Um, if you think about your customers, however, your customers, the way they derive value, and your customers are up there on the left, they derive value via the ends, you know, what they're looking for in the products that they buy, okay? So they derive value from the ends that your products, your means provide, okay? So if customers derive value from the ends, what they get out of your products, but you make money off the means, there's a disconnect here. Okay, and that disconnect usually creates risk for customers. Okay, so what you find um, already for, for, for several years now, but I think this will only speed up now, is that you've got some businesses, okay, feeling the pressure maybe from new entrants, where you're seeing there are companies coming in, some startups or some, some, some competitors coming in, and instead of making money off the means, the products and services, they start making money off the A here stands for access, giving access to people instead of selling stuff. Subscriptions being the classic example of this. Some more advanced company, instead of making money off the product or giving access to the product via subscription, they make money off the consumption, the C of customers by having pay as you go model, okay? Metering models. And some even more sophisticated companies do not make money off the means, do not make money off the access, like a subscription or the consumption pay as you go, but off the P, the performance that is actually provided to customers. Customers, in order to get the ends they look for, have to have access, have to have consumption, have to see performance. Ownership through the means is unnecessary, actually. It's something that we as a firm do it because it's comfortable to us. So as you have, since we're in this sort of crisis situation, it is actually also a very good time to start thinking about, hold on a second, how much risk am I putting on the shoulders of customers? 
Is it really risk they should be having? Because if my product is better than the competition, why am I not taking on some of the risk? And start thinking about moving yourself to some of these revenue models, access models, consumption model, performance models, that are actually more aligned with what customers are actually looking for, which increases their loyalty and expands your marketplace. Okay, so these are the things that I want to speak about today. At the end of the day, what I've tried to say really, really fast is, look, you've got, you're in the middle bunch of firms, okay? You're not benefiting from the crisis. You're not, you know, really, 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 really hurting. You need to do something now in keeping an eye on the future. But at the same time, you actually face a situation where your customers still see you as different. Keep your eye on the price. Don't become much more internal. Keep your eyes on the price and do everything you can, those five things and more, to get them to buy, right, while still being focused on the brand that makes you sort of uh, who you are, right? On that note, uh, thank you very much. You may, I suppose you may have questions. I'm going to uh, stop sharing here. I think I've done that well. And I'm back to Riol, I think. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for sharing with all of us uh, your perspective on how can we play with the pricing, no, uh, to try to boost sales in this in these difficult moments. Uh, now we have uh, time for a few questions, so you can send them to us uh, in the chat, and uh, I will convey them to to Marco. Uh, we have a. Uh, a uh, first question, uh, and in fact, there are some people uh, who would like to have a bit more of detail on. You were talking about the quid pro quo, no? Uh, yeah. So giving a discount, but asking for something, no? Uh, in return, and you were uh, discussing about the two uh, different possibilities: uh, the condition uh, or tying that to a certain condition, uh, which is strategically important for you, no? Uh, or to uh, trying to develop certain customer behavior that reinforces your brand. People are uh, asking if you could give a bit more detail into that and if there are any typologies of this condition. That, uh, yeah, uh, fine, okay, yeah, so, um, okay, so let's just rewind a second here. So what am I doing here? The typical way of thinking about a discount is I scratch your back, you scratch mine. That's the end of the story, right? And so what I do is I lower my price hoping that you buy. I'm thinking, in this situation where folks are more socially conscious, uh, morals play much of a bigger role, I'm going to make an effort as a company to get you to buy. This is the perfect time to ask for something else in return, okay? Something else that maybe is not that much of a big deal by the customer, but to you is a big deal. So two ways, one is strategic, a strategic goal, the other one is a behavior. And in terms of typology, there isn't that much more. By strategic goal, what I mean is what makes your business tick? If you're Dropbox and your business is fundamentally based on user, num user numbers and network effects, then you would like people's behavior to be targeted and improving that. If you're Amazon and really what matters is locking of customers and that comes from Prime, make your discount conditional on joining Prime. On the other side, if your behavior is all about um, I'm thinking of, of a health insurance company. And uh, in recent years, there have been all these health insurances that have been launched where you get a discount based on how well you live. If you run and you record it, if you eat well, that is perfectly and a good example of what I mean, right? My campaign, my insurance is about, hey, I'm going to help you live a better life, but put your money where your mouth is. Or better said, put the customer's money where your mouth is. Understand what your brand is about and ask a behavior that makes the customer stop and say, yeah, I belong to that brand. I hope that Excellent. helps. Thank you, Marco. There's a couple of uh, people that they are also asking a very, they have similar questions. And these questions that they have have to do with, uh, what about pricing in the luxury sector? No, uh, Are there any specific no, uh, conditions, any specific uh, cities that they should take into consideration? Yes. So, um, okay. So we, I think luxury, uh, you know, if you think about the beginning of my presentation, when I was talking about the three kinds of emoticons and the one in the middle is the one that we, I was really focusing on. I think luxury is almost the classic example of a company where structural demand is certain. Because if you are 
are facing a, a big, big economic shock, what goes up first? Luxury, okay? Now, here, uh, the problem with some of the things I was talking about, like the discounting part, which is kind of in the middle of my presentation, with, of course, with luxury brands, you always think about discounts as, you know, uh, that really, really, really hurts my brand. And I tend to agree, I tend to agree, unless the discount has the condition tied to the brand. So here we would have to, I would have to think about this some more, and I, and I don't have the time now on my feet to think about this. But the idea would be, if I want to do a discount as a luxury brand, much more important than all the other examples, make sure that that discount is tied to something about the essence of my brand. Because I want people to understand that the discount is tied to a particular shock, not something about the, the quality of my product. Okay? okay? I think, I mean, fast, eh? That's my response. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have... Uh... A first, uh, a last third question. Uh, the, the duration is about uh, of the webinar, thirty minutes. We are, we are there right now, and this is from a former student of uh, both of us, Nur, uh, that he's asking uh, because of the lockdown and the reduced disposable income. Some clients are adopting uh, older alternatives to a product. Imagine buying PlayStation th Three instead of Four. No, uh, how can you avoid these through pricing strategies? Right. Okay. So a, a bigger example of what Nor and by the way, Nor, hi. Uh, a bigger example of what Nor is mentioning is cars. Right. You might be going out to buy an old model, you know, than a, than a new model. Look, uh, on the positive side, they're buying your car uh, as opposed to buying some other brands' cars. So I'll be rejoicing just for that. And then the uh, look, I I would almost see that as one way of managing this fluidity. If that's the word that I was mentioning at the very beginning. My point one. I, in this situation, I am happy with that. What you might want to do, though, if you see this happening, you keep, so you're keeping the customer within your brand, which is a great thing. Maybe then work at the same time in some way to get people to upgrade faster than the normal upgrade cycle. So if somebody changes a PlayStation or somebody goes through a PlayStation every three years, maybe try to find some mechanism in the meantime to get them to upgrade in, an, in a year and a half. But no, at the very least, they're buying a PlayStation. And not a switch, which I think is interesting, or nothing else, or nothing at all, which is important already. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, webinar and for sharing with us these five tips, no, our recommendations that we can apply to pricing in these very uncertain times. And thank you very much uh, to all the attendants uh, for uh, having uh, taken part in this uh, webinar. If uh, you want to watch it again, uh, this is going to be available on our website, uh, YouTube, and LinkedIn channels. Hope you to see you very soon in our new uh, webinar at this Stay Connected uh, series by, by SL. Thank you very much. Thank you.